A member of one of our classes told of a request made by his wife. She and a group of other women in her church were involved in a self-improvement program. She asked her husband to help her by listing six things he believed she could do to help herself become a better wife. He reported to the class, I was surprised by such a request. Frankly, it would have been easy for me to list six things I would like to change about her my heavens, she could have listed a thousand things she would like to change about me but I didn't. I said to her, let me think about it, and give you an answer in the morning. The next morning I got up very early and called the florist, and had them send six red roses to my wife with a note saying, I can't think of six things I would like to change about you, I love you the way you are. When I arrived at home that evening, who do you think greeted me at the door? That's right, my wife. She was almost in tears. Needless to say, I was extremely glad I had not criticized her as she had requested. The following Sunday at church, after she had reported the results of her assignment, several women with whom she had been studying came up to me and said, that was the most considerate thing I have ever heard. It was then I realized the power of appreciation. Florence Ziegfeld, the most spectacular producer who ever dazzled Broadway, gained his reputation by his subtle ability to glorify the American girl. Time after time, he took drab little creatures that no one ever looked at twice and transformed them on the stage into glamorous visions of mystery and seduction. Knowing the value of appreciation and confidence, he made women feel beautiful by the sheer power of his gallantry and consideration. He was practical. He raised the salary of chorus girls from $30 a week to as high as $175. And he was also chivalrous. On opening night at the Follies, he sent telegrams to the stars and the cast, and he deluged every chorus girl in the show with American beauty roses. I once succumbed to the fat of fasting and went for six days and nights without eating. It wasn't difficult. I was less hungry at the end of the sixth day than I was at the end of the second. Yet I know, as you know, people who would think they had committed a crime, if they let their families or employees go for six days without food, but they will let them go for six days, and six weeks, and sometimes sixty years, without giving them the hearty appreciation that they crave almost as much as they crave food. When Alfred Lunt, one of the great actors of his time, played the leading role in Reunion in Vienna, he said, there is nothing I need so much as nourishment for my self-esteem. We nourish the bodies of our children and friends and employees, but how seldom do we nourish their self-esteem. We provide them with roast beef and potatoes to build energy but we neglect to give them kind words of appreciation that would sing in their memories for years, like the music of the morning stars. Paul Harvey, in one of his radio broadcasts, the rest of the story told how showing sincere appreciation could change a person's life. He reported that years ago a teacher in Detroit asked Stevie Morris to help her find a mouse that was lost in the classroom. You see, she appreciated the fact that nature had given Stevie something no one else in the room had. Nature had given Stevie a remarkable pair of ears to compensate for his blind eyes. But this was really the first time Stevie had been shown appreciation for those talented ears. Now, years later, he says that this act of appreciation was the beginning of a new life. You see, from that time on he developed his gift of hearing and went on to become, under the stage name of Stevie Wonder, one of the great pop singers and songwriters of the 70s. Paul Orant, Paul Harvey's The Rest of the Story, New York, Doubleday, 1977, edited and compiled by Lynn Harvey, copyright by Pollen Incorporated. Some readers are saying right now as they read these lines, oh, fooey, flattery, bear oil. I've tried that stuff. It doesn't work not with intelligent people. Of course flattery seldom works with discerning people. It is shallow, selfish and insincere. It ought to fail and it usually does. True, some people are so hungry, so thirsty for appreciation that they will swallow anything, just as a starving man will eat grass and fishworms. Even Queen Victoria was susceptible to flattery. Prime Minister Benjamin Disraeli confessed that he put it on thick in dealing with the Queen. To use his exact words, he said he spread it on with a trowel, but Disraeli was one of the most polished, deft and adroit men who ever ruled the far-flung British Empire. He was a genius in his line. 
What would work for him wouldn't necessarily work for you and me. In the long run, flattery will do you more harm than good. Flattery is counterfeit, and like counterfeit money, it will eventually get you into trouble if you pass it to someone else. The difference between appreciation and flattery, that is simple. One is sincere and the other insincere. One comes from the heart out, the other from the teeth out. One is unselfish, the other selfish. One is universally admired, the other universally condemned. I recently saw a bust of Mexican hero General Alvaro Obregón in the Chapultepec Palace in Mexico City. Below the bust are carved these wise words from General Obregón's philosophy. Don't be afraid of enemies who attack you. Be afraid of the friends who flatter you. King George V had a set of six maxims displayed on the walls of his study at Buckingham Palace. One of these maxims said, teach me neither to proffer nor receive cheap praise. That's all flattery is cheap praise. I once read a definition of flattery that may be worth repeating. Flattery is telling the other person precisely what he thinks about himself. Use what language you will said Ralph Waldo Emerson. You can never say anything but what you are. If all we had to do was flatter, everybody would catch on. And we should all be experts in human relations. When we are not engaged in thinking about some definite problem, we usually spend about 95% of our time thinking about ourselves. Now, if we stop thinking about ourselves for a while and begin to think of the other person's good points, we won't have to resort to flattery so cheap and false that it can be spotted almost before it is out of the mouth. One of the most neglected virtues of our daily existence is appreciation. Somehow, we neglect to praise our son or daughter when he or she brings home a good report card, and we fail to encourage our children when they first succeed in baking a cake or building a birdhouse. Nothing pleases children more than this kind of parental interest and approval. The next time you enjoy filet mignon at the club, send word to the chef that it was excellently prepared, and when a tired salesperson shows you unusual courtesy, please mention it. Every minister, lecturer and public speaker knows the discouragement of pouring himself or herself out to an audience and not receiving a single ripple of appreciative comment. What applies to professionals applies doubly to workers in offices, shops and factories and our families and friends. Try leaving a friendly trail of little sparks of gratitude on your daily trips. You will be surprised how they will set small flames of friendship that will be rose beacons on your next visit. Pamela Dunham of New Fairfield, Connecticut had among her responsibilities on her job the supervision of a janitor who was doing a very poor job. The other employees would jeer at him and litter the hallways to show him what a bad job he was doing. It was so bad productive time was being lost in the shop. Honest appreciation got results where criticism and ridicule failed. Hurting people not only does not change them, it is never called for. There is an old saying that I have cut out and pasted on my mirror, where I cannot help but see it every day. I shall pass this way but once, any good, therefore, that I can do or any kindness that I can show to any human being. Let me do it now. Let me not defer nor neglect it, for I shall not pass this way again. Emerson said, every man I meet is my superior in some way, in that, I learn of him. If that was true of Emerson, isn't it likely to be a thousand times more true of you and me? Let's cease thinking of our accomplishments, our wants. Let's try to figure out the other person's good points. Then forget flattery. Give honest, sincere appreciation. Be hearty in your approbation and lavish in your praise, and people will cherish your words and treasure them, and repeat them over a lifetime. Repeat them, years after you have forgotten them. Principle 2. Give honest and sincere appreciation. 3. He who can do this has the whole world with him. He who cannot walks a lonely way. I often went fishing up in Maine during the summer. Personally I am very fond of strawberries and cream, but I have found that for some strange reason, fish prefer worms. So when I went fishing, I didn't think about what I wanted. I thought about what they wanted. I didn't bait the hook with strawberries and cream. Rather, I dangled a worm or a grasshopper in front of the fish and said, wouldn't you like to have that? Why not use the same common sense when fishing for people? That is what Lloyd George, Great Britain's Prime Minister during World War I, did. When someone asked him how he managed to stay in power after the other wartime leaders Wilson, Orlando and Clemenceau had been forgotten, 
He replied that if his staying on top might be attributed to any one thing, it would be to his having learned that it was necessary to bait the hook to suit the fish. Why talk about what we want? That is childish, absurd. Of course, you are interested in what you want. You are eternally interested in it. But no one else is. The rest of us are just like you. We are interested in what we want. So the only way on earth to influence other people is to talk about what they want and show them how to get it. Remember that tomorrow when you are trying to get somebody to do something, if, for example, you don't want your children to smoke, don't preach at them, and don't talk about what you want, but show them that cigarettes may keep them from making the basketball team or winning the 100-yard dash. This is a good thing to remember, regardless of whether you are dealing with children or calves or chimpanzees. For example, one day Ralph Waldo Emerson and his son tried to get a calf into the barn, but they made the common mistake of thinking only of what they wanted. Emerson pushed and his son pulled. But the calf was doing just what they were doing. He was thinking only of what he wanted, so he stiffened his legs and stubbornly refused to leave the pasture. The Irish housemaid saw their predicament. She couldn't write essays and books, but, on this occasion at least, she had more horse sense, or calf sense, than Emerson had. She thought of what the calf wanted, so she put her maternal finger in the calf's mouth and let the calf suck her finger as she gently led him into the barn. Every act you have ever performed since the day you were born was performed because you wanted something. How about the time you gave a large contribution to the Red Cross? Yes, that is no exception to the rule. You gave the Red Cross the donation because you wanted to lend a helping hand. You wanted to do a beautiful, unselfish, divine act. Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. If you hadn't wanted that feeling more than you wanted your money, you would not have made the contribution. Of course, you might have made the contribution because you were ashamed to refuse, or because a customer asked you to do it. But one thing is certain, you made the contribution because you wanted something. Harry A. Overstreet in his illuminating book Influencing Human Behavior said, Action springs out of what we fundamentally desire and the best piece of advice which can be given to would-be persuaders, whether in business, in the home, in the school, in politics, is, first, arouse in the other person an eager want. He who can do this has the whole world with him. He who cannot walks a lonely way. Andrew Carnegie, the poverty-stricken Scotch lad who started to work at two cents an hour, and finally gave away $365 million, learned early in life that the only way to influence people is to talk in terms of what the other person wants. He attended school only four years, yet he learned how to handle people. To illustrate, his sister-in-law was worried sick over her two boys. They were at Yale and they were so busy with their own affairs that they neglected to write home and paid no attention whatever to their mother's frantic letters. Then Carnegie offered to wager a hundred dollars that he could get an answer by return mail without even asking for it. Someone called his bed. So he wrote his nephews a chatty letter, mentioning casually in a postscript that he was sending each one a $5 bill. He neglected, however, to enclose the money. Back came replies by return mail thanking dear Uncle Andrew for his kind note and you can finish the sentence yourself. Another example of persuading comes from Stan Novak of Cleveland, Ohio, a participant in our course. Stan came home from work one evening to find his youngest son, Tim, kicking and screaming on the living room floor. He was to start kindergarten the next day and was protesting that he would not go. Stan's normal reaction would have been to banish the child to his room and tell him he'd just better make up his mind to go. He had no choice, but tonight, recognizing that this would not really help Tim start kindergarten in the best frame of mind, Stan sat down and thought, if I were Tim, why would I be excited about going to kindergarten? He and his wife made a list of all the fun things Tim would do, such as finger painting, singing songs, making new friends. Then they put them into action. We all started finger painting on the kitchen table my wife, Lil, 
my other son Bob, and myself, all having fun. Soon Tim was peeping around the corner, next he was begging to participate. Oh, no. You have to go to kindergarten first to learn how to finger paint. With all the enthusiasm I could muster I went through the list talking in terms he could understand, telling him all the fun he would have in kindergarten. The next morning, I thought I was the first one up. I went downstairs and found Tim sitting sound asleep in the living room chair. What are you doing here? I asked. I'm waiting to go to kindergarten. I don't want to be late. The enthusiasm of our entire family had aroused in Tim, an eager want that no amount of discussion or threat could have possibly accomplished. Tomorrow you may want to persuade somebody to do something. Before you speak pause and ask yourself, how can I make this person want to do it? That question will stop us from rushing into a situation heedlessly, with futile chatter about our desires. At one time I rented the grand ballroom of a certain New York hotel for 20 nights in each season in order to hold a series of lectures. At the beginning of one season, I was suddenly informed that I should have to pay almost three times as much rent as formerly. This news reached me after the tickets had been printed and distributed and all announcements had been made. Naturally, I didn't want to pay the increase. But what was the use of talking to the hotel about what I wanted? They were interested only in what they wanted. So a couple of days later I went to see the manager. I was a bit shocked when I got your letter I said, but I don't blame you at all. If I had been in your position, I should probably have written a similar letter myself. Your duty as the manager of the hotel is to make all the profit possible. If you don't do that, you will be fired and you ought to be fired. Now, let's take a piece of paper and write down the advantages and the disadvantages that will accrue to you if you insist on this increase in rent. Then I took a letterhead and ran a line through the center and headed one column advantages and the other column disadvantages. I wrote down under the head advantages these words, ballroom free. Then I went on to say, you will have the advantage of having the ballroom free to rent for dances and conventions. That is a big advantage for affairs like that will pay you much more than you can get for a series of lectures. If I tie your ballroom up for 20 nights during the course of the season, it is sure to mean a loss of some very profitable business to you. Now, let's consider the disadvantages. First, instead of increasing your income from me, you are going to decrease it. In fact, you are going to wipe it out because I cannot pay the rent you are asking. I shall be forced to hold these lectures at some other place. There's another disadvantage to you also. These lectures attract crowds of educated and cultured people to your hotel. That is good advertising for you, isn't it? In fact, if you spent $5,000 advertising in the newspapers, you couldn't bring as many people to look at your hotel as I can bring by these lectures. That is worth a lot to a hotel, isn't it? As I talked, I wrote these two disadvantages under the proper heading and handed the sheet of paper to the manager saying, I wish you would carefully consider both the advantages and disadvantages that are going to accrue to you, and then give me your final decision. I received a letter the next day, informing me that my rent would be increased only 50% instead of 300%. Mind you, I got this reduction without saying a word about what I wanted. I talked all the time about what the other person wanted and how he could get it. Suppose I had done the human, natural thing, Suppose I had stormed into his office and said, what do you mean by raising my rent 300% when you know the tickets have been printed and the announcements made? 300%. Ridiculous. Absurd. I won't pay it. What would have happened then? An argument would have begun to steam and boil and sputter, and you know how arguments end. Even if I had convinced him that he was wrong, his pride would have made it difficult for him to back down and give in. Here is one of the best bits of advice ever given about the fine art of human relationships. If there is any one secret of success said Henry Ford, it lies in the ability to get the other person's point of view and see things from that person's angle as well as from your own. That is so good, I want to repeat it. If there is any one secret of success, it lies in the ability to get the other person's point of view and see things from that person's angle as well as from your own. That is so simple, so obvious, that anyone ought to see the truth of it at a glance. 
Yet 90% of the people on this earth ignore it 90% of the time. An example, look at the letters that come across your desk tomorrow morning, and you will find that most of them violate this important canon of common sense. Take this one, a letter written by the head of the radio department of an advertising agency, with offices scattered across the continent. This letter was sent to the managers of local radio stations throughout the country. I have set down in brackets my reactions to each paragraph. Mr. John Blank, Blankville, Indiana. Dear Mr. Blank, the company desires to retain its position in advertising agency leadership in the radio field. Who cares what your company desires? I am worried about my own problems. The bank is foreclosing the mortgage on my house. The bugs are destroying the hollyhocks. The stock market tumbled yesterday. I missed the 8.15 this morning. I wasn't invited to the Jones dance last night. The doctor tells me I have high blood pressure and neuritis and dandruff. And then what happens? I come down to the office this morning worried. Open my mail, and here is some little whippersnapper off in New York, yapping about what his company wants. Bah! If he only realized what sort of impression his letter makes, he would get out of the advertising business and start manufacturing sheep dip. This agency's national advertising accounts were the bulwark of the network. Our subsequent clearances of station time have kept us at the top of agencies year after year. You are big and rich and right at the top, are you? So what? I don't give two whoops and Hades if you are as big as General Motors and General Electric and the general staff of the U.S. Army all combined. If you had as much sense as a half-witted hummingbird, you would realize that I am interested in how big I am not how big you are. All this talk about your enormous success makes me feel small and unimportant. We desire to service our accounts with the last word on radio station information. You desire. You desire. You unmitigated ass. I'm not interested in what you desire or what the President of the United States desires. Let me tell you once and for all that I am interested in what I desire. And you haven't said a word about that yet in this absurd letter of yours. Will you, therefore, put the company on your preferred list for weekly station information? Every single detail that will be useful to an agency in intelligently booking time. Preferred list. You have your nerve. You make me feel insignificant by your big talk about your company. And then you ask me to put you on a preferred list. And you don't even say please when you ask it. A prompt acknowledgement of this letter, giving us your latest doings, will be mutually helpful. You fool. You mail me a cheap form letter a letter scattered far and wide, like the autumn leaves and you have the gall to ask me, when I am worried about the mortgage and the hollyhocks and my blood pressure, to sit down and dictate a personal note acknowledging your form letter, and you ask me to do it promptly. What do you mean, promptly? Don't you know I am just as busy as you are or, at least, I like to think I am. And while we are on the subject, who gave you the lordly right to order me around? You say it will be mutually helpful. At last, at last, you have begun to see my viewpoint. But you are vague about how it will be to my advantage. Very truly yours, John Doe, Manager Radio Department. P.S. The enclosed reprint from the Blankville Journal will be of interest to you and you may want to broadcast it over your station. Finally, down here in the postscript, you mentioned something that may help me solve one of my problems. Why didn't you begin your letter with, but what's the use? Any advertising man who is guilty of perpetrating such drivel as you have sent me has something wrong with his medulla oblongata. You don't need a letter giving our latest doings. What you need is a quart of iodine in your thyroid gland. Now, if people who devote their lives to advertising and who pose as experts in the art of influencing people to buy, if they write a letter like that, what can we expect from the butcher and baker or the auto mechanic? Here is another letter, written by the superintendent of a large freight terminal to a student of this course, Edward Vermelin. What effect did this letter have on the man to whom it was addressed? Read it and then I'll tell you. A. Zaragas Sons Incorporated, 28 Front Street, Brooklyn, New York, 11201. Attention, Mr. Edward Vermelin, gentlemen. The operations at our outbound rail receiving station are handicapped because a material percentage of the total business is delivered us in the late afternoon. This condition results in congestion, over time on the part of our forces, 
delays to trucks, and in some cases delays to freight. On November 10, we received from your company a lot of 510 pieces, which reached here at 4.20 p.m. We solicit your cooperation toward overcoming the undesirable effects arising from late receipt of freight. May we ask that, on days on which you shipped the volume which was received on the above date, effort be made either to get the truck here earlier, or to deliver us part of the freight during the morning. The advantage that would accrue to you under such an arrangement would be that of more expeditious discharge of your trucks and the assurance that your business would go forward on the date of its receipt. Very truly yours, J. B. Supt. After reading this letter, Mr. Vermelin, sales manager for A. Zarega's Sons Incorporated, sent it to me with the following comment. This letter had the reverse effect from that which was intended. The letter begins by describing the terminal's difficulties, in which we are not interested, generally speaking. Our cooperation is then requested without any thought as to whether it would inconvenience us, and then, finally, in the last paragraph, the fact is mentioned that if we do cooperate, it will mean more expeditious discharge of our trucks, with the assurance that our freight will go forward on the date of its receipt. In other words, that in which we are most interested is mentioned last, and the whole effect is one of raising a spirit of antagonism, rather than of cooperation. Let's see if we can't rewrite and improve this letter. Let's not waste any time talking about our problems. As Henry Ford admonishes, let's get the other person's point of view and see things from his or her angle, as well as from our own. Here is one way of revising the letter. It may not be the best way, but isn't it an improvement? Mr. Edward Vermelin, A. Zarega's Sons Incorporated, 28 Front Street, Brooklyn, New York, 11201. Dear Mr. Vermelin, your company has been one of our good customers for 14 years. Naturally, we are very grateful for your patronage and are eager to give you the speedy, efficient service you deserve. However, we regret to say that it isn't possible for us to do that when your trucks bring us a large shipment late in the afternoon, as they did on November 10. Why? because many other customers make late afternoon deliveries also, naturally, that causes congestion. That means your trucks are held up unavoidably at the pier, and sometimes even your freight is delayed. That's bad, but it can be avoided. If you make your deliveries at the pier in the morning when possible, your trucks will be able to keep moving. Your freight will get immediate attention, and our workers will get home early at night to enjoy a dinner of the delicious macaroni and noodles that you manufacture. Regardless of when your shipments arrive, we shall always cheerfully do all in our power to serve you promptly. You are busy. Please don't trouble to answer this note. Yours truly. J. B. Supt. Barbara Anderson, who worked in a bank in New York, desired to move to Phoenix, Arizona because of the health of her son, using the principles she had learned in our course, she wrote the following letter to 12 banks in Phoenix. Dear Sir, my 10 years of bank experience should be of interest to a rapidly growing bank like yours. In various capacities in bank operations with the Bankers Trust Company in New York, leading to my present assignment as branch manager. I have acquired skills in all phases of banking, including depositor relations, credits, loans and administration. I will be relocating to Phoenix in May, and I am sure I can contribute to your growth and profit. I will be in Phoenix the week of April 3, and would appreciate the opportunity to show you how I can help your bank meet its goals. Sincerely, Barbara L. Anderson. Do you think Mrs. Anderson received any response from that letter? Eleven of the twelve banks invited her to be interviewed, and she had a choice of which banks offer to accept. Why? Mrs. Anderson did not state what she wanted, but wrote in the letter how she could help them and focused on their wants, not her own. Thousands of salespeople are pounding the pavements today, tired, discouraged and underpaid. Why? because they are always thinking only of what they want. They don't realize that neither you nor I want to buy anything. If we did, we would go out and buy it. But both of us are eternally interested in solving our problems. And if salespeople can show us how their services or merchandise will help us solve our problems, they won't need to sell us. We'll buy. And customers like to feel that they are buying. 
not being sold, yet many salespeople spend a lifetime in selling without seeing things from the customer's angle. For example, for many years I lived in Forest Hills, a little community of private homes in the center of greater New York. One day as I was rushing to the station, I chanced to meet a real estate operator who had bought and sold property in that area for many years. He knew Forest Hills well. So I hurriedly asked him whether or not my stucco house was built with metal lath or hollow tile. He said he didn't know and told me what I already knew, that I could find out by calling the Forest Hills Garden Association. The following morning, I received a letter from him. Did he give me the information I wanted? He could have gotten it in 60 seconds by a telephone call, but he didn't. He told me again that I could get it by telephoning and then asked me to let him handle my insurance. He was not interested in helping me. He was interested only in helping himself. J. Howard Lucas of Birmingham, Alabama, tells how two salespeople from the same company handled the same type of situation, he reported. Several years ago I was on the management team of a small company. Headquartered near us was the district office of a large insurance company. Their agents were assigned territories, and our company was assigned to two agents, whom I shall refer to as Carl and John. One morning, Carl dropped by our office and casually mentioned that his company had just introduced a new life insurance policy for executives and thought we might be interested later on, and he would get back to us when he had more information on it. The same day, John saw us on the sidewalk while returning from a coffee break, and he shouted, Hey, Luke, hold up. I have some great news for you fellows. He hurried over and very excitedly told us about an executive life insurance policy his company had introduced that very day. It was the same policy that Carl had casually mentioned. He wanted us to have one of the first issued. He gave us a few important facts about the coverage and ended saying, the policy is so new. I'm going to have someone from the home office come out tomorrow and explain it. Now, in the meantime, let's get the application signed and on the way, so he can have more information to work with. His enthusiasm aroused in us an eager want for this policy, even though we still did not have details. When they were made available to us, they confirmed John's initial understanding of the policy, and he not only sold each of us a policy, but later doubled our coverage. Carl could have had those sales, but he made no effort to arouse in us any desire for the policies. The world is full of people who are grabbing and self-seeking, so the rare individual who unselfishly tries to serve others has an enormous advantage. He has little competition. Owen D. Young, a noted lawyer and one of America's great business leaders, once said, people who can put themselves in the place of other people who can understand the workings of their minds need never worry about what the future has in store for them. If out of reading this book you get just one thing an increased tendency to think always in terms of other people's point of view and see things from their angle if you get that one thing out of this book, it may easily prove to be one of the building blocks of your career. Looking at the other person's point of view and arousing in him an eager want for something is not to be construed as manipulating that person so that he will do something that is only for your benefit and his detriment. Each party should gain from the negotiation. In the letters to Mr. Vermelin, both the sender and the receiver of the correspondence gain by implementing what was suggested. Both the bank and Mrs. Anderson won by her letter in that the bank obtained a valuable employee and Mrs. Anderson a suitable job, and in the example of John's sale of insurance to Mr. Lucas, both gain through this transaction. Another example in which everybody gains through this principle of arousing an eager want comes from Michael E. Whitten of Warwick, Rhode Island, who is a territory salesman for the Shell Oil Company. Mike wanted to become the number one salesperson in his district, but one service station was holding him back. It was run by an older man who could not be motivated to clean up his station. It was in such poor shape that sales were declining significantly. This manager would not listen to any of Mike's pleas to upgrade the station. After many exhortations and heart-to-heart -heart talks all of which had no impact Mike decided to invite the manager to visit the newest Shell station in his territory. The manager was so impressed by the facilities at the new station that when Mike visited him the next time, his station was cleaned up and had recorded a sales increase. This enabled Mike to reach the number one spot in his district. 
all his talking and discussion hadn't helped, but by arousing an eager want in the manager, by showing him the modern station, he had accomplished his goal, and both the manager and Mike benefited. Most people go through college and learn to read Virgil and master the mysteries of calculus without ever discovering how their own minds function. For instance, I once gave a course in effective speaking for the young college graduates who were entering the employ of the Carrier Corporation, the large air conditioner manufacturer. One of the participants wanted to persuade the others to play basketball in their free time. And this is about what he said, I want you to come out and play basketball. I like to play basketball, but the last few times I've been to the gymnasium, there haven't been enough people to get up a game. Two or three of us got to throwing the ball around the other night and I got a black eye. I wish all of you would come down tomorrow night. I want to play basketball. Did he talk about anything you want? You don't want to go to a gymnasium that no one else goes to, do you? You don't care about what he wants. You don't want to get a black eye. Could he have shown you how to get the things you want by using the gymnasium? Surely. More pep. Keener edge to the appetite. Clearer brain. Fun. Games. Basketball. To repeat Professor Overstreet's wise advice, first, arouse in the other person an eager want. He who can do this has the whole world with him. He who cannot walks a lonely way. One of the students in the author's training course was worried about his little boy. The child was underweight and refused to eat properly. His parents used the usual method. They scolded and nagged. Mother wants you to eat this and that. Father wants you to grow up to be a big man. Did the boy pay any attention to these pleas? Just about as much as you pay to one fleck of sand on a sandy beach. No one with a trace of horse sense would expect a child three years old to react to the viewpoint of a father thirty years old. Yet that was precisely what that father had expected. It was absurd. He finally saw that. So he said to himself, what does that boy want? How can I tie up what I want to what he wants? It was easy for the father when he started thinking about it. His boy had a tricycle that he loved to ride up and down the sidewalk in front of the house in Brooklyn. A few doors down the street lived a bully a bigger boy who would pull the little boy off his tricycle and ride it himself. Naturally, the little boy would run screaming to his mother and she would have to come out and take the bully off the tricycle and put her little boy on again. This happened almost every day. What did the little boy want? It didn't take a Sherlock Holmes to answer that one. His pride, his anger, his desire for a feeling of importance, all the strongest emotions and his makeup goaded him to get revenge, to smash the bully in the nose. And when his father explained that the boy would be able to wallop the daylights out of the bigger kid someday, if he would only eat the things his mother wanted him to eat when his father promised him that there was no longer any problem of dietetics, that boy would have eaten spinach, sauerkraut, salt mackerel anything, in order to be big enough to whip the bully who had humiliated him so often. After solving that problem, the parents tackled another. The little boy had the unholy habit of wetting his bed. He slept with his grandmother. In the morning, his grandmother would wake up and feel the sheet and say, Look, Johnny, what you did again last night. He would say, No, I didn't do it. You did it. Scolding, spanking, shaming him, reiterating that the parents didn't want him to do it. None of these things kept the bed dry. So the parents asked, how can we make this boy want to stop wetting his bed? What were his wants? First, he wanted to wear pajamas like daddy, instead of wearing a nightgown like grandmother. Grandmother was getting fed up with his nocturnal iniquities, so she gladly offered to buy him a pair of pajamas if he would reform. Second, he wanted a bed of his own. Grandma didn't object. His mother took him to a department store in Brooklyn winked at the salesgirl, and said, here is a little gentleman who would like to do some shopping. The salesgirl made him feel important by saying, young man, what can I show you? He stood a couple of inches taller and said, I want to buy a bed for myself. When he was shown the one his mother wanted him to buy, she winked at the salesgirl, and the boy was persuaded to buy it. The bed was delivered the next day, and that night, when father came home, the little boy ran to the door shouting, Daddy, Daddy, come upstairs and see my bed that I bought. The father, looking at the bed, obeyed Charles Schwab's injunction. He was hearty in his approbation and lavish in his praise. You are not going to wet this bed, 
are you? The father said, oh, no, no, I am not going to wet this bed. The boy kept his promise for his pride was involved. That was his bed. He and he alone had bought it. And he was wearing pajamas now like a little man. He wanted to act like a man. And he did. Another father, K.T. Dutchman, a telephone engineer, a student of this course couldn't get his three-year-old daughter to eat breakfast food. The usual scolding, pleading, coaxing methods had all ended in futility. So the parents asked themselves, how can we make her want to do it? The little girl loved to imitate her mother, to feel big and grown up, so one morning they put her on a chair and let her make the breakfast food. At just the psychological moment, father drifted into the kitchen while she was stirring the cereal, and she said, Oh, look, Daddy, I am making the cereal this morning. She ate two helpings of the cereal without any coaxing, because she was interested in it. She had achieved a feeling of importance. She had found in making the cereal an avenue of self-expression. William Winter once remarked that self-expression is the dominant necessity of human nature. Why can't we adapt this same psychology to business dealings? When we have a brilliant idea, instead of making others think it is ours, why not let them cook and stir the idea themselves? They will then regard it as their own. They will like it and maybe eat a couple of helpings of it. Remember, first, arouse in the other person an eager want. He who can do this has the whole world with him. He who cannot walks a lonely way. Principle 3. Arouse in the other person an eager want. In a nutshell, fundamental techniques in handling people. Principle 1. Don't criticize, condemn or complain. Principle 2. Give honest and sincere appreciation. Principle 3. Arouse in the other person an eager want. Part 2. Six ways to make people like you. 4. Do this and you'll be welcome anywhere. Why read this book to find out how to win friends? Why not study the technique of the greatest winner of friends the world has ever known? Who is he? You may meet him tomorrow coming down the street. When you get within 10 feet of him, he will begin to wag his tail. If you stop and pat him, he will almost jump out of his skin to show you how much he likes you. And you know that behind this show of affection on his part, there are no ulterior motives. He doesn't want to sell you any real estate. And he doesn't want to marry you. Did you ever stop to think that a dog is the only animal that doesn't have to work for a living? A hen has to lay eggs, a cow has to give milk and a canary has to sing. But a dog makes his living by giving you nothing but love. When I was five years old, my father bought a little yellow-haired pup for 50 cents. He was the light and joy of my childhood. Every afternoon about 4.30, he would sit in the front yard with his beautiful eyes staring steadfastly at the path, and as soon as he heard my voice or saw me swinging my dinner pail through the buck brush, he was off like a shot. Racing breathlessly up the hill to greet me with leaps of joy and barks of sheer ecstasy. Tippy was my constant companion for five years. Then one tragic night I shall never forget it he was killed within ten feet of my head killed by lightning. Tippy's death was the tragedy of my boyhood. You never read a book on psychology, Tippy. You didn't need to. You knew by some divine instinct that you can make more friends in two months, by becoming genuinely interested in other people than you can in two years, by trying to get other people interested in you. Let me repeat that. You can make more friends in two months by becoming interested in other people than you can in two years, by trying to get other people interested in you. Yet I know and you know people who blunder through life trying to wigwag other people into becoming interested in them. Of course, it doesn't work. People are not interested in you. They are not interested in me. They are interested in themselves morning, noon and after dinner. The New York Telephone Company made a detailed study of telephone conversations to find out which word is the most frequently used. You have guessed it. It is the personal pronoun I. 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 It was used 3,900 times in 500 telephone conversations. I. 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 When you see a group photograph that you are in, whose picture do you look for first? If we merely try to impress people and get people interested in us, we will never have many true, sincere friends. Friends, real friends, are not made that way. Napoleon tried it. And in his last meeting with Josephine he said, Josephine, I have been as fortunate as any man ever was on this earth, and yet, at this hour, 
you are the only person in the world on whom I can rely, and historians doubt whether he could rely even on her. Alfred Adler, the famous Viennese psychologist, wrote a book entitled What Life Should Mean to You. In that book he says, it is the individual who is not interested in his fellow men who has the greatest difficulties in life and provides the greatest injury to others. It is from among such individuals that all human failures spring. You may read scores of erudite tomes on psychology without coming across a statement more significant for you and for me. Adler's statement is so rich with meaning that I am going to repeat it in italics. It is the individual who is not interested in his fellow men who has the greatest difficulties in life and provides the greatest injury to others. It is from among such individuals that all human failures spring. I once took a course in short story writing at New York University, and during that course, the editor of a leading magazine talked to our class. He said he could pick up any one of the dozens of stories that drifted across his desk every day, and after reading a few paragraphs, he could feel whether or not the author liked people. If the author doesn't like people he said, people won't like his or her stories. This hard-boiled editor stopped twice in the course of his talk on fiction writing, and apologized for preaching a sermon. I am telling you he said the same things your preacher would tell you. But remember, you have to be interested in people if you want to be a successful writer of stories. If that is true of writing fiction, you can be sure it is true of dealing with people face to face. I spent an evening in the dressing room of Howard Thurston the last time he appeared on Broadway. Thurston was the acknowledged dean of magicians. For 40 years he had traveled all over the world, time and again, creating illusions, mystifying audiences, and making people gasp with astonishment. More than 60 million people had paid admission to his show, and he had made almost $2 million in profit. I asked Mr. Thurston to tell me the secret of his success. His schooling certainly had nothing to do with it, for he ran away from home as a small boy, became a hobo, rode in boxcars, slept in haystacks, begged his food from door to door, and learned to read by looking out of boxcars at signs along the railway. Did he have a superior knowledge of magic? No, he told me hundreds of books had been written about Le Germain, and scores of people knew as much about it as he did. But he had two things that the others didn't have. First, he had the ability to put his personality across the footlights. He was a master showman. He knew human nature. Everything he did, every gesture, every intonation of his voice, every lifting of an eyebrow, had been carefully rehearsed in advance and his actions were timed to split seconds. But, in addition to that, Thurston had a genuine interest in people. He told me that many magicians would look at the audience and say to themselves, well, there is a bunch of suckers out there, a bunch of hicks, I'll fool them all right. But Thurston's method was totally different. He told me that every time he went on stage he said to himself, I am grateful because these people come to see me. They make it possible for me to make my living in a very agreeable way. I'm going to give them the very best I possibly can. He declared he never stepped in front of the footlights without first saying to himself over and over, I love my audience. I love my audience. Ridiculous. Absurd. You are privileged to think anything you like. I am merely passing it on to you without comment as a recipe used by one of the most famous magicians of all time. George Dyke of North Warren, Pennsylvania, was forced to retire from his service station business after 30 years when a new highway was constructed over the site of his station. It wasn't long before the idle days of retirement began to bore him, so he started filling in his time trying to play music on his old fiddle. Soon he was traveling the area to listen to music and talk with many of the accomplished fiddlers. In his humble and friendly way he became generally interested in learning the background and interests of every musician he met. Although he was not a great fiddler himself, he made many friends in this pursuit. He attended competitions and soon became known to the country music fans in the eastern part of the United States as Uncle George, the fiddle scraper from Kinsua County. When we heard Uncle George, he was 72 and enjoying every minute of his life. By having a sustained interest in other people, he created a new life for himself at a time when most people consider their productive years over. 
That too was one of the secrets of Theodore Roosevelt's astonishing popularity. Even his servants loved him. His valet, James E. Amos, wrote a book about him entitled Theodore Roosevelt, Hero to His Valet. In that book Amos relates this illuminating incident. My wife one time asked the president about a bobwhite. She had never seen one, and he described it to her fully. Some time later, the telephone at our cottage rang. Amos and his wife lived in a little cottage on the Roosevelt estate at Oyster Bay. My wife answered it, and it was Mr. Roosevelt himself. He had called her, he said to tell her that there was a bobwhite outside her window and that if she would look out she might see it. Little things like that were so characteristic of him. Whenever he went by our cottage, even though we were out of sight, we would hear him call out, ooh, ooh, ooh Annie, or ooh, 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 James. It was just a friendly greeting as he went by. How could employees keep from liking a man like that? How could anyone keep from liking him? Roosevelt called at the White House one day when the president and Mrs. Taft were away. His honest liking for humble people was shown by the fact that he greeted all the old White House servants by name, even the scullery maids. When he saw Alice, the kitchen maid writes Archie but, he asked her if she still made cornbread. Alice told him that she sometimes made it for the servants but no one ate it upstairs. They show bad taste Roosevelt boomed, and I'll tell the president, so when I see him, Alice brought a piece to him on a plate and he went over to the office eating it as he went and greeting gardeners and laborers as he passed. He addressed each person just as he had addressed them in the past. Ike Hoover, who had been head usher at the White House for 40 years, said with tears in his eyes, it is the only happy day we had in nearly two years, and not one of us would exchange it for a hundred dollar bill. The same concern for the seemingly unimportant people helped sales representative Edward M. Sykes Jr. of Chatham, New Jersey retain an account. Many years ago he reported, I called on customers for Johnson & Johnson in the Massachusetts area. One account was a drugstore in Hingham. Whenever I went into this store I would always talk to the soda clerk and sales clerk for a few minutes before talking to the owner to obtain his order. One day I went up to the owner of the store and he told me to leave as he was not interested in buying J&J &J products anymore because he felt they were concentrating their activities on food and discount stores to the detriment of the small drug store. I left with my tail between my legs and drove around the town for several hours. Finally, I decided to go back and try at least to explain our position to the owner of the store. When I returned I walked in and as usual said hello to the soda clerk and sales clerk. When I walked up to the owner, he smiled at me and welcomed me back. He then gave me double the usual order. I looked at him with surprise and asked him what had happened since my visit only a few hours earlier. He pointed to the young man at the soda fountain and said that after I had left, the boy had come over and said that I was one of the few salespeople that called on the store that even bothered to say hello to him and to the others in the store. He told the owner that if any salesperson deserved his business, it was I. The owner agreed and remained a loyal customer. I never forgot that to be genuinely interested in other people is a most important quality for a salesperson to possess for any person, for that matter. I have discovered from personal experience that one can win the attention and time and cooperation of even the most sought-after people by becoming genuinely interested in them. Let me illustrate. Years ago I conducted a course in fiction writing at the Brooklyn Institute of Arts and Sciences, and we wanted such distinguished and busy authors as Kathleen Norris, Fanny Hurst, Ida Tarbell, Albert Pace and Terhune and Rupert Hughes to come to Brooklyn and give us the benefit of their experiences. So we wrote them saying we admired their work and were deeply interested in getting their advice and learning the secrets of their success. Each of these letters was signed by about 150 students. We said we realized that these authors were busy too busy to prepare a lecture. So we enclosed a list of questions for them to answer about themselves and their methods of work. They liked that. Who wouldn't like it? So they left their homes and traveled to Brooklyn to give us a helping hand. By using the same method, I persuaded Leslie M. Shaw, Secretary of the Treasury and Theodore Roosevelt's cabinet. George W. Wickersham, Attorney General in Taft's cabinet, William Jennings Bryan, Franklin D. Roosevelt, 
and many other prominent men to come to talk to the students of my courses in public speaking. All of us, be we workers in a factory, clerks in an office or even a king upon his throne all of us like people who admire us. Take the German Kaiser, for example. At the close of World War I he was probably the most savagely and universally despised man on this earth. Even his own nation turned against him when he fled over into Holland to save his neck. The hatred against him was so intense that millions of people would have loved to tear him limb from limb, or burn him at the stake. In the midst of all this forest fire of fury, one little boy wrote the Kaiser a simple, sincere letter glowing with kindliness and admiration. This little boy said that no matter what the others thought, he would always love Wilhelm as his emperor. The Kaiser was deeply touched by his letter and invited the little boy to come to see him. The boy came, so did his mother and the Kaiser married her. That little boy didn't need to read a book on how to win friends and influence people. He knew how instinctively, if we want to make friends, let's put ourselves out to do things for other people things that require time, energy, unselfishness and thoughtfulness. When the Duke of Windsor was Prince of Wales, he was scheduled to tour South America, and before he started out on that tour, he spent months studying Spanish, so that he could make public talks in the language of the country, and the South Americans loved him for it. For years I made it a point to find out the birthdays of my friends. How? Although I haven't the foggiest bit of faith in astrology, I began by asking the other party whether he believed the date of one's birth has anything to do with character and disposition. I then asked him or her to tell me the month and day of birth. If he or she said November 24, for example, I kept repeating to myself, November 24, November 24. The minute my friend's back was turned, I wrote down the name and birthday, and later would transfer it to a birthday book. At the beginning of each year, I had these birthday dates scheduled in my calendar pad so that they came to my attention automatically. When the natal day arrived, there was my letter or telegram. What a hit it made! I was frequently the only person on earth who remembered. If we want to make friends, let's greet people with animation and enthusiasm. When somebody calls you on the telephone use the same psychology. Say hello in tones that bespeak how pleased you are to have the person call. Many companies train their telephone operators to greet all callers in a tone of voice that radiates interest and enthusiasm. The caller feels the company is concerned about them. Let's remember that when we answer the telephone tomorrow, showing a genuine interest in others not only wins friends for you, but may develop in its customers a loyalty to your company. In an issue of the publication of the National Bank of North America of New York, the following letter from Madeline Rosedale, a depositor, was published. Eagle, publication of the Natermal Bank of North America, New York, March 31, 1978. I would like you to know how much I appreciate your staff. Everyone is so courteous, polite and helpful. What a pleasure it is, after waiting on a long line, to have the teller greet you pleasantly. Last year my mother was hospitalized for five months. Frequently I went to Marie Petrocello, a teller. She was concerned about my mother and inquired about her progress. Is there any doubt that Mrs. Rosedale will continue to use this bank? Charles R. Walters, of one of the large banks in New York City, was assigned to prepare a confidential report on a certain corporation. He knew of only one person who possessed the facts he needed so urgently. As Mr. Walters was ushered into the president's office, a young woman stuck her head through a door and told the president that she didn't have any stamps for him that day. I am collecting stamps for my 12-year-old son the president explained to Mr. Walters. Mr. Walters stated his mission and began asking questions. The president was vague, general, nebulous. He didn't want to talk, and apparently nothing could persuade him to talk. The interview was brief and barren. Frankly, I didn't know what to do Mr. Walters said, as he related the story to the class. Then I remembered what his secretary had said to him stamps, 12-year-old son and I also recalled that the foreign department of our bank collected stamps stamps taken from letters pouring in from every continent washed by the seven seas. 
The next afternoon I called on this man and sent in word that I had some stamps for his boy. Was I ushered in with enthusiasm? Yes sir, he couldn't have shaken my hand with more enthusiasm if he had been running for Congress. He radiated smiles and goodwill. My George will love this one he kept saying as he fondled the stamps. And look at this. This is a treasure. We spent half an hour talking stamps and looking at a picture of his boy and he then devoted more than an hour of his time to giving me every bit of information I wanted without my even suggesting that he do it. He told me all he knew, and then called in his subordinates and questioned them. He telephoned some of his associates. He loaded me down with facts, figures, reports and correspondence. In the parlance of newspaper reporters, I had a scoop. Here is another illustration. C. M. Naffel Jr. of Philadelphia had tried for years to sell fuel to a large chain store organization, but the chain store company continued to purchase its fuel from an out-of-town dealer and haul it right past the door of Naffel's office. Mr. Naffel made a speech one night before one of my classes, pouring out his hot wrath upon chain stores, branding them as a curse to the nation, and still he wondered why he couldn't sell them. I suggested that he try different tactics. To put it briefly, this is what happened. We staged a debate between members of the course on whether the spread of the chain store is doing the country more harm than good. Naffel, at my suggestion, took the negative side, he agreed to defend the chain stores, and then went straight to an executive of the chain store organization that he despised and said, I am not here to try to sell fuel. I have come to ask you to do me a favor. He then told about his debate and said, I have come to you for help, because I can't think of anyone else who would be more capable of giving me the facts I want. I'm anxious to win this debate, and I'll deeply appreciate whatever help you can give me. Here is the rest of the story in Mr. Naffel's own words. I had asked this man for precisely one minute of his time. It was with that understanding that he consented to see me. After I had stated my case. He motioned me to a chair and talked to me for exactly one hour and 47 minutes. He called in another executive who had written a book on chain stores. He wrote to the National Chain Store Association and secured for me a copy of a debate on the subject. He feels that the chain store is rendering a real service to humanity. He is proud of what he is doing for hundreds of communities. His eyes fairly glowed as he talked and I must confess that he opened my eyes to things I had never even dreamed of. He changed my whole mental attitude. As I was leaving, he walked with me to the door, put his arm around my shoulder, wished me well in my debate, and asked me to stop in and see him again, and let him know how I made out. The last words he said to me were, please see me again later in the spring, I should like to place an order with you for fuel. To me that was almost a miracle. Here he was offering to buy fuel without my even suggesting it. I had made more headway in two hours by becoming genuinely interested in him and his problems than I could have made in ten years, trying to get him interested in me and my product. You didn't discover a new truth, Mr. Naffel, for a long time ago, a hundred years before Christ was born a famous old Roman poet, Publilius Cyrus, remarked, we are interested in others when they are interested in us. A show of interest, as with every other principle of human relations, must be sincere. It must pay off not only for the person showing the interest, but for the person receiving the attention. It is a two-way street both parties benefit. Martin Ginsburg, who took our course in Long Island, New York, reported how the special interest a nurse took in him profoundly affected his life. It was Thanksgiving Day and I was 10 years old. I was in a welfare ward of a city hospital and was scheduled to undergo major orthopedic surgery the next day. I knew that I could only look forward to months of confinement, convalescence and pain. My father was dead, my mother and I lived alone in a small apartment, and we were on welfare. My mother was unable to visit me that day. As the day went on, I became overwhelmed with the feeling of loneliness, despair and fear. I knew my mother was home alone worrying about me, not having anyone to be with, not having anyone to eat with, and not even having enough money to afford a Thanksgiving Day dinner. The tears welled up in my eyes, and I stuck my head under the pillow and pulled the covers over it. I cried silently, but oh so bitterly, so much that my body racked with pain. 
A young student nurse heard my sobbing and came over to me. She took the covers off my face and started wiping my tears. She told me how lonely she was having to work that day and not being able to be with her family. She asked me whether I would have dinner with her. She brought two trays of food, sliced turkey, mashed potatoes, cranberry sauce and ice cream for dessert. She talked to me and tried to calm my fears. Even though she was scheduled to go off duty at 4 p.m., she stayed on her own time until almost 11 p.m. She played games with me, talked to me and stayed with me until I finally fell asleep. Many Thanksgivings have come and gone since I was 10, but one never passes without me remembering that particular one and my feelings of frustration, fear, loneliness, and the warmth and tenderness of the stranger that somehow made it all bearable. If you want others to like you, if you want to develop real friendships, if you want to help others at the same time as you help yourself, keep this principle in mind.